Imagine a force of nature so colossal, it defies easy comprehension. A river, not merely flowing, but thundering through the heart of a continent with the raw, untamed power of a god. This is the Congo River, the second most voluminous river. On Earth, an artery of life and power pulsing with an energy that could, quite literally, illuminate a continent. For generations, this immense power has been a source of obsession for engineers, a tool for politicians, and a dream for visionaries. They have all dreamed of harnessing it, of taming its wild spirit in a single, monumental feat of human ambition. A project so vast, so audacious, it dwarfs all others. Its name is whispered with a mixture of awe and trepidation. The Grand Inga Dam. This is the vision. A titan of concrete and steel rising from the riverbanks. An $80 billion megastructure, promising to generate a staggering 40,000. Megawatts of electricity. That's double the output of China's Three Gorges Dam, currently the largest power station in the world. The dream is to weave a web of light across Africa, to lift hundreds of millions from the darkness of energy poverty, and to forge a new, electrified future for nations from the Cape of Good Hope to the shores of the Mediterranean. It is a dream of African progress, African power, and African ingenuity, on a scale the world has never witnessed. But every great dream casts a long shadow. What if this magnificent vision is in fact a mirage? What if the promise of light conceals a darkness far more profound and dangerous than its champions are willing to admit? The headline that brought you here is not hyperbole. The Grand Inga Dam could indeed flood half of Africa. Not just with water, but with a torrent of crippling debt, a deluge of political chaos, an unstoppable flood of environmental devastation, and a wave of human suffering that could destabilize the entire continent for a century. This is the untold story of the world's most powerful and perilous dam, a geopolitical time bomb ticking silently in the heart of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The sheer scale of what is at stake here is almost beyond imagination, and it's a story that touches the future of global energy, international politics, and the very health of our planet. And because these are the complex, world-altering stories that need to be told, I want to ask you to join our community of thinkers and explorers. Please, take a moment to click that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Your support is the energy that powers this channel, allowing us to dive deep into the issues that truly matter. It makes a world of difference. Our journey begins in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a nation of staggering paradoxes. It is a land blessed with an almost mythical abundance of natural wealth. Diamonds, gold, cobalt, copper, and of course, the river itself. Yet, it remains one of the poorest, most troubled nations on Earth. Here, just 150 kilometers southwest of the sprawling capital, Kinshasa, the mighty Congo River undergoes a dramatic transformation. It narrows, funnels, and then plunges through a breathtaking 15-kilometer stretch of cataracts and rapids known as the Inga Falls. This is not a single picturesque waterfall, but a violent, churning staircase of water, where the river drops nearly 100 meters. The volume of water that surges through this channel is mind-boggling an average of over 42,000 cubic meters every single second. To put that in perspective, that's enough water to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool in less than a second, every second of every day. It is, without any exaggeration, the single greatest concentration of hydroelectric potential on the entire planet. The dream to capture this power is not new. The foundations were laid during the Cold War era, under the patronage of the dictator. Mobutu Sese Seko, the first two dams, Inga 1, completed in 1972, and Inga 2 in 1982, were built as monuments to his rule. But they stand today as decaying relics of a broken promise. Plagued by decades of corruption, civil war, and systemic mismanagement, they operate at a mere fraction of their intended capacity. In a cruel twist of irony, the majority of the electricity they do manage to produce is sent hundreds of miles south to power the lucrative mining operations in the Katanga province, bypassing the millions of Congolese citizens who live in literal darkness, right next to the source of all this power. This is the first and most bitter lesson of Inga. 
It is a story of immense power that has failed to illuminate the very people it displaced and disenfranchised. But the Grand Inga is a different beast entirely. It's not just another dam, it's a continental re-engineering project. The full scheme is a cascade of six separate dams, built in phases. The next step, a project in itself known as Inga 3, would already be a giant, generating nearly 5,000 megawatts. But the final culminating structure, the full Grand Inga, is the true prize, designed to produce that jaw-dropping 40,000 megawatts of electricity. Let's try to grasp that number. It's more than the entire installed electricity capacity of Pakistan. It's more power than is generated by all of Sub-Saharan Africa's existing hydroelectric facilities combined, excluding South Africa. It could single-handedly double the continent's current electricity supply. The plan is to send, this power surging across thousands of kilometers through a network of high-voltage direct current, or HVDC, transmission lines. These are essentially electrical superhighways, capable of carrying massive loads over vast distances with minimal energy loss. One proposed line would stretch an incredible 5,000 kilometers south to power South Africa's industrial heartland. Another would travel north, potentially reaching Nigeria and even crossing the Sahara to Egypt. The proponents of this project, a powerful coalition including the African Development Bank, various governments, and a host of multinational engineering and finance corporations paint a truly utopian picture. They argue that Grandinga is the silver bullet for Africa's development challenges. With a foundation of cheap, reliable, and ostensibly clean energy, factories could flourish, economies could diversify away from raw material exports, and a new era of industrial prosperity could finally dawn. They frame it as a crucial climate solution, a way for Africa to leapfrog the fossil fuel dependent development path taken by the West. For the DRC government, it is a project of immense national pride and a pathway to economic sovereignty. The dam would become the nation's single greatest asset, a cash machine generating billions of dollars in revenue from selling power to its neighbors. It would transform the DRC from a perpetual recipient of international aid into a continental energy broker, Africa's beating heart, pumping electrical lifeblood to its every corner. So, if the dream is so magnificent, where is the nightmare? Why, after decades of planning, has this world-changing project not been built? The answer lies in a tangled web of risks that are every bit as colossal as the dam itself. Let's start with the price tag, $80 billion. And that figure is widely considered a optimistic best-case scenario estimate. History teaches us that mega-projects of this scale are notorious for spectacular cost overruns. The Channel Tunnel, the Three Gorges Dam, countless Olympic Games, they all ended up costing double or even triple their initial budgets. The real cost of Grand Inga could easily balloon to over $100 billion, perhaps even more. For a country like the DRC, with a total annual GDP of around $65 billion, taking on this level of debt is a gamble of terrifying proportions. It's like a family with a $65,000 annual income taking out a $100 billion mortgage. It risks plunging the nation into a debt trap so deep it might never escape, effectively ceding control of its most valuable resource to foreign creditors. Increasingly, those creditors are nations like China, which use infrastructure lending as a powerful tool to expand their strategic and economic influence across Africa. Then there is the political rot, the cancer of corruption. The DRC consistently ranks among the most corrupt countries on the planet. The tragic saga of Inga 1 and 2 is a case study in how public funds for massive projects can be siphoned off into the pockets of a kleptocratic elite, leaving the infrastructure to crumble. With a project worth $100 billion on the table, the potential for graft is almost unimaginable. Who ensures the lucrative construction contracts are awarded fairly? Who audits the vast sums of money to ensure it is spent? On steel and concrete, not on luxury villas in Europe and hidden offshore bank accounts. The World Bank, once a major potential backer, tellingly withdrew its funding from the Inga 3 phase in 2016. Its official reason pointed to a lack of transparency and fundamental disagreements over the project's strategic direction within the Congolese government itself. This was a massive red flag. 
When the world's foremost development institution, an organization that exists to fund exactly these kinds of projects, walks away, it sends a clear signal that the risks of catastrophic failure due to mismanagement and corruption are unacceptably high. This brings us to the geopolitical flood. Imagine the DRC, a nation with a deeply troubled history of political instability, civil war, and authoritarian rule, controlling the light switch for half of Africa. A stable, democratic, and responsible DRC might wield this immense power for the collective good. But what happens if a future regime, a military junta, or a desperate dictator decides to use control over the continental power grid as a political weapon? They could hold entire nations hostage, demanding political concessions, favorable trade terms, or exorbitant prices under the threat of a continent-wide blackout. The spider's web of HVDC lines, intended to unite Africa, could instead become tripwires for devastating new conflicts. Nations like Egypt, already locked in a tense standoff with Ethiopia over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on the Blue, Nile would be extraordinarily hesitant to make themselves dependent on yet another upstream nation for a resource as critical as electricity. The project, meant to foster unity, could sow the seeds of division and war for generations. And now, we must confront the most direct and devastating flood of all, the environmental and human cost. To build a dam of this magnitude, you must first create a truly massive reservoir. The full Grand Inga project would require flooding the entire Bundy Valley, submerging an area of several hundred square kilometers underwater. This is not an empty, pristine wilderness. It is a living landscape, home to towns, dozens of villages, and vast areas of fertile farmland. Initial, conservative estimates suggest that at least 35,000 people would be directly displaced by the Inga Three phase alone. The full Grand Inga could force 100,000 people from their ancestral homes. And where do they go? The global history of dam-related resettlement is a shameful chronicle of broken promises, wholly inadequate compensation, and communities shattered, impoverished, and cast aside in the name of progress. The ecological impact radiates far beyond. The reservoir's edge, the Congo River, is a complex living system, and a dam of this size acts as a concrete wall, a catastrophic blockage. It would trap up to 90% of the nutrient-rich sediment that naturally flows down the river. This sediment is the lifeblood of the entire downstream ecosystem. It fertilizes the floodplains that support agriculture for millions. More critically, it flows out into the Atlantic, replenishing the coastline and nourishing the incredibly rich marine ecosystem in what is known as the Congo Plume. This plume is one of the most productive fishing grounds in the region. Starving the river of its sediment would trigger rapid coastal erosion, threatening coastal communities. It would cause a collapse in fish stocks that millions of people rely on for their primary source of protein. It would fundamentally and irreversibly alter the chemistry of the ocean for hundreds of kilometers. Furthermore, the dam would be an impenetrable barrier for the river's aquatic life. The Congo River Basin is a global hotspot of biodiversity, second only to the Amazon, with over 700 known fish species, many of which are found nowhere else on Earth and many more that remain undiscovered by science. The dam would block ancient migration routes, devastating fish populations, and likely driving many unique species to extinction. It is the ultimate tragic paradox. A project championed as green energy that would cause an ecological catastrophe on a scale that is difficult to fathom. Perhaps the most cynical and heartbreaking part of the entire grand plan lies in answering. One simple question, who will actually get the power? Just as with the failed Inga 1 and 2, the primary destination for Grand Inga's electricity is not the homes, schools, and hospitals of the Congolese people. Today, less than 10% of the DRC's population has access to reliable electricity. In rural areas, it's less than 1%. The horrifying, yet explicitly stated plan is for the vast majority of that 40,000 megawatts to be exported to the industrial and mining hubs in South Africa and sold to multinational mining corporations operating within. The DRC, 
The most likely scenario is one where the people whose lives and lands are sacrificed for the dam will continue to live in darkness, watching the power lines carry their stolen birthright over their heads to distant, wealthier consumers. It is a textbook case of neo-colonial extraction, a development model that deepens inequality by taking resources from the poor for the primary benefit of the rich and powerful. This is the impasse where the project stands today. The Grand Inga Dam remains a tantalizing dream on paper, a project perpetually on the verge of groundbreaking, yet always stalled by its own immense weight. Competing international consortiums, one led by Chinese state-owned companies, and another by Spanish firms, have jockeyed for the lead role, creating political paralysis and infighting within the DRC government. The financial risks are too great, the political situation too volatile, and the chorus of environmental and social opposition too loud to ignore. And yet, the dream refuses to die. Because the raw power of the Congo River is simply too great. A prize for the world to forget. Beneath this grand dilemma, a quieter conversation is happening. Is a single, centralized megaproject the only path forward? Critics and energy experts point to a more resilient, equitable, and sustainable alternative. A decentralized approach. Africa is blessed with some of the world's best solar and wind resources. Investing a fraction of Grand Inga's cost in widespread solar panels, small-scale micro-hydro projects, and wind farms could bring power directly to the communities that need it most, creating local jobs and empowering people without the catastrophic risks of a single point of failure. This approach is less monumental, less prestigious for politicians, but potentially far more effective at actually lighting up the continent. So we are left with a monumental choice, a defining question for Africa's future. Is the Grand Inga Dam a necessary, if painful, step in the continent's long march towards development? A sacrifice that must be made for a brighter, electrified future? Or is it a 21st century white elephant? A reckless neo-colonial gamble that will enrich a small elite, empower foreign interests, and burden the people of the Congo with a legacy of debt, conflict, and environmental ruin? The story of this dam is more than just a story about concrete and turbines. It is a parable for our time. It forces us to ask the most fundamental questions about the very nature of progress. Does development have to come at the cost of displacement and destruction? Who should own, control, and benefit from the world's great natural resources? And can we, as a global community, find the wisdom to build a future where power, both electrical and political, is shared by all, rather than hoarded by a few? The thundering waters of the Inga Falls hold the potential to reshape a continent. But whether that reshaping leads to shared prosperity, or a deeper tragedy hangs precariously in the balance, caught between a magnificent dream and a terrifying nightmare.